This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Hi, I'm Richard Gershon, the host of In Legal Terms and a professor at the University of Mississippi School of Law. If you miss a live In Legal Terms episode, find our podcast, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. Thanks for being with us this morning. I am Dr. Susan Buttress, and this is Relatively Speaking. And today we're going to talk about a topic that continues to come up on a regular basis just in the last few weeks with schools starting back up and 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 maybe just parents and grandparents dealing with things in general. My question is... When attention and concentration are a problem, what is the real issue? Is it ADHD? Is it anxiety? Is it depression? Or could it be something else? Or maybe could it be both? More than one thing. So, or could it be that the uh, medication that, that you or one of your loved ones is taking is just not working like it's supposed to do? Or could the medication be working for something, but perhaps not working for something else? So how do you tell the difference? It can be confusing for kids, teens, and adults. And doing the detective work to understand what's going on is absolutely necessary to be able to find out what the solutions are that will work. I think so many times we think that a diagnosis can be quick and the treatment can be easy. And many times with these behavioral health, mental health disorders, it's just not that easy. They're, the recipes differ for, for each individual. And what may work for a 150-pound adult may not work for a 100-pound adult. What may work for a 30-pound child may not work for the same 30-pound child. So today, we're going to talk through everything that you really need to be looking at as you're moving through, making sure that you're getting an one appropriate diagnosis for whatever the struggles are, and, and then two, not only having the right diagnosis, but making sure that you have the right treatment to go along with it. And so... I think you've heard, I think listeners, if you've, if you've listened to any of, any of our Southern Remedy shows, you've, you've heard about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and we can talk about the specifics of that. You've also heard about on many um, of our local and our national shows about anxiety disorders because we know that they are common in adults. And and somewhat common in children, too. And so it seems that they have become more common as we have gone through the last, what, three to five years with we we talk about the the pre and post covid i guess everybody understands that we're really not post covid at all we just had the pandemic and now we are sort of in that endemic period right we're just kind of accepting it at this point yeah. that's kind of that's the stage that we're in it's like a stage of grief where it's acceptance is the final <laughs> the final part of it <laughs> Abram, I think you have it. So, um, as we, Abram and I were talking before the show, he said, I, I don't know a whole lot about ADHD, but I, I do know a, a lot about anxiety. <laughs> and, um, and I think that most people in our, our world today, unfortunately, do know a lot about anxiety and, you know, used to. It was that more people probably talked about ADHD. If something was going on with them and they didn't have good concentration or things didn't feel like they were going well for them, many people would attribute it to 
what we now call attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But what all the experts say now is that in adults particularly, anxiety is more common than ADHD. In the adult population, we're looking at about 4.5% of adults continuing to have ADHD. That's still a fair number. But in the adult population for anxiety disorders, it's more like 19 or 20 percent. Oh, wow. Isn't that that's, huge? That's one in five people. Yeah. That's crazy. It's, I believe it, though. It's yeah. a lot. It's a lot. Now, do all of those individuals qualify for a full-blown major anxiety disorder? I'm not sure. Uh, and we can talk about the different anxiety disorders and what's what. We can talk about the crossover in ADHD. And listeners, I I can also talk to you about medication and whether or not Uh, If you have any questions about perhaps the medication you might be on or the treatment that you're on or that your child or grandchild's on, because I just am finding that this is an overwhelming issue. I have, in I would say in the last two weeks, had more emails, phone calls, text about this problem area about whether it's anxiety or ADHD or medicine's not working or not being able to get into treatment is another big issue or even not even looking at the treatment, just not being able to to feel like you're in the right direction for a diagnosis. So um, I'm here today to try to answer questions because I know there are many out there that are ongoing. I'm here today to talk to you about how we can differentiate between what's anxiety causing inattention and what is the true inattention. And then as we age, I know the question has come up in probably many of our listeners' minds, is this just age? And is that why I'm not absorbing things? So that that last thing I mentioned, is it just age that's making me not pay attention, not absorb things, or, or forget things? I, I, I want to remind people that in this day and time, longevity should be better, longer, and it... Also, we, we may need to keep in mind that if you in your 60s or 70s are start thinking that perhaps it could be age, don't do that. Don't, don't let yourself start thinking that because we should, as older adults, continue to be able to concentrate continue to be able to read things and remember them, should be able to uh, follow a two- or three-step command, we should we should be able to stay on track with that. So don't write it off as just age. If you are seeing those signs or symptoms, let's let's talk about what perhaps that could be. So as we move along, One thing I want to do is just sort of set the stage for everybody to remember that that there are a couple of disorders that we do not expect to suddenly appear in the aged, okay? That's one thing is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That shouldn't just all of the sudden appear, even in a 10th grader in school, And then I'm going to stretch it a little bit. You know, according to the diagnostic criteria, they say symptoms should appear by at least 12 years of age. And that is true. But I want to just give a a quick scenario that if you have a child that's been doing fabulously until they're 10 or 11, and then suddenly symptoms appear at 12 or 13, 
then you better be doing a lot of hard work making sure that's ADHD and not something else. Okay? So symptoms may not be great. You may have a child who maybe takes a little extra work, but you should not have sudden presentation of symptoms after nothing at all. Okay, I'm excited to see we have our first caller, Justin, in Memphis. Um, hey, Justin, you have some questions about ADHD meds? Yes. So um, I am 47 years old. I was diagnosed um, last, late last year with ADHD, and I followed up with several doctors just making sure that that was the correct path. Mm-hmm. I've previously been treated for depression and anxiety with uh, Lexapro, uh-huh. and um, I, with the ADHD diagnosis, um, I was thinking that maybe the ADHD was the umbrella that the that the anxiety, depression, and 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 some other um, <clears throat> types of things were under. So started on Kelbury while weaning myself off of the Lexapro. This is all with doctor's approval, of course. Good. Um, and, and so I guess a couple of things. It, it's difficult for me to square the fact that how extreme my ADHD is with none of my teachers, therapists, doctors ever mentioning it to me. I mean, mm. once I started looking into it, it's, obvious. It's like, uh, it's really good to have um, an explanation about why I am how I am, mm-hmm. right? You're right. Um, right. And, and so uh, that's been really enlightening. Um, but I was just wondering if you have much experience with the, the drug Kelbury, and um, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And um, it, will you will it, you spell that great. for me, Justin? I want to make sure I'm. You've got the right. I've Q- got. The... E is Q E L B R E E. It's relatively new. It's a norepinephrine uptake inhibitor. Right, um, Quilbury. Yeah. yeah, yeah, is how I say it. And and yes, I I do have some experience. It is relatively new, and um, it it works somewhat it's norepinephrine and when we're looking at ADHD we're looking at um, dopamine and norepinephrine as far as um, the neurochemicals that seem to help us the most with ADHD um, with concentration and and paying attention norepinephrine can also um, be involved it's one of those neurochemicals besides serotonin that can be involved with uh, depression and anxiety as can um, um, serotonin and so I think that as we are looking I think many times things aren't as clean as we would like for them to be I think we right. we say serotonin for depression and norepinephrine and dopamine for um, for ADHD, but but things are not as clean, and there's often intermixing. And one thing that we have found is that there's some medicines that work well, like Quilbury or um, also uh, Stratera. Atomoxetine is another one of those medicines that might help with depression and anxiety in addition to ADHD, according to the studies. And so, Justin, I want to ask you a few questions because I think it might help the listeners as we're stepping through. Uh, How long ago were you initially treated for the depression or anxiety? At what age, would you say? Four or five years ago. It was about four or five years ago. Okay. Did you have any trouble going through school as far as just making grades that you thought you should or staying on task or completing things? Or or did this suddenly happen? Yeah? Yeah? No, no. 
uh, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm laughing because, you know, it, it's very classic ADHD. Mm. My grades were A's or C's. Like, uh, yeah. if I was interested, um, I hyper-focused, completely, you know, uh, immersed myself in learning about it, uh, everything about it. And then if I wasn't interested, you know, I would just barely skate by. And yeah. that's... That was through grade school, um, high school, and and even in college. You know, mm. um, got through. Yeah. But um, you know, frustrating uh, to be so hot and cold. Um, yeah. Uh, of a of a learner. You know. <laughs> well, you know, and that is absolutely classic. Is that if you're really interested, you can focus, and in fact, sometimes hyper focus, and that can almost be a problem. Um, and so, but that that way up or way down kind of issue is, and and I'll tell you, Justin, probably what protected you is that that you were bright, and having a, a little bit higher IQ and is is often helpful and I don't know perhaps you had parents who help keep you on track a bit uh, and and yeah. that that can be helpful obviously many times right so you know I got um, the the classic ADHD um, line which is a uh, very intelligent if he would just apply himself uh-huh. right? you know, maybe lazy right, right? <laughs> right, right. If, if he would just pay attention, yeah, you know, uh, he he would do much better in school. So, you know that that's that's one of the you know one of the things that as I look back through, you know, my life through this lens, this new lens that I have of of my ADHD diagnosis, that I'm, you know, I kind of uh, shake my head and think, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> How could <laughs> it be missed? Great. Right. How could it have been yeah. So the other thing that, that I'll just mention as we're talking about this is that many times when you have somebody who's bright who is being told if you would just apply yourself, if you would just pay attention, then what happens? You become anxious because now you know everybody's telling you you're underperforming and you can't make yourself perform better. Um, and and it's highly frustrating. So what happens often is there is that anxiety that is going on, and maybe you get depressed, too, because your achievement is so hard. You look around, you see these other people, and you think you're as smart as they are, yet I'm still not achieving like I should. What in the heck is wrong with me? And so many times that's when you start having that comorbidity sneak in is because now you're stressed. Now now you're anxious because now you're underperforming. So that is why there's a, been a lot of new information out there. We used to say, well, you know, you always want to treat the anxiety first. Because okay. if there's a comorbidity, you want to make sure that it's not the anxiety keeping you from from being inattentive. S- the answer truly Great. is oh. to make sure you treat the one that's most problematic first. So um, I, that's that's good to know. So you know, just being um, you know kind of a cautious person, I wanted to make sure I wasn't on any unnecessary medicine. So. Uh, there was an overlap in the Lexapro and the Quelbury or Kelbury, and um, that really seemed to be working very well in ways that I didn't expect. Um, some of the overeating, um, uh, emotional regulation, all that stuff, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. all that stuff was better. Mm-hmm. And um, as I come off the Lexapro, um, the Calvary is doing a good job at some of those things, but not quite as good of a job as they were both doing together. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I'm just sort of coming to that realization uh, you know, yeah. this week as, well, as I'm going through this process of, of pairing down. Yeah. 
And so, Justin, you just mentioned mm. something that that obviously I'm going to talk about as we move through the show, and that is that you can have the comorbidity. So yeah. you mentioned, and you're right, you're looking at two different drugs. Um, one works more on norepinephrine, the other more on serotonin, two different neurochemicals. Maybe you need a little bit of both. I don't know that, but I would highly encourage you to call your physician and tell them what you just told us, and that is that when you were weaning down and you were you you were on the the new medicine, that it seemed like maybe you were in a sweet spot. If you don't want to miss that, then then you need to talk with your doc and make sure that he or she doesn't want you to wean all the way off, but maybe just on a lower dose of your Lexapro. Because that also can be great if you can have a a very small dose of something. So I think the other mistake people often make is they wean down all the way off, and then they go, "Uh uh-oh, I'm not as good, and so they go all the way back up when maybe a half dose would be effective. So call your doc, you. okay, do that today, <laughs> and let them know what your thoughts are. Absolutely. We're, we're in that process right now. We're in that conversation Great. Uh, right now. So, so yes, the, the, she is definitely in, in on this conversation. Um, yeah, I, I was on a low dose of Lexapro anyway, and mm-hmm. like a 10 milligram, I went down to five, mm-hmm. but I can definitely feel the difference. Yeah. Uh, uh, definitely. And one of the things I really wanted you to talk about so, so other people understand, because it took me really doing a lot of research since November to understand uh, what ADHD actually is. And, um, you know, I think there's a, in the zeitgeist, there's sort of this, uh, maybe misconception that it's only just being distractible. Oh, look, there's a squirrel out the window. Um, and that a lot of people don't quite understand that it's a neurodevelopmental disorder that affects, you know, your executive function, right. that, it, that it's a, um, a dopamine deficiency, and that it's all of these things yep. and not just, and, and that the hyperfocus can be, you know, the the other end of the spectrum of the distractibility. Absolutely. And you can have both of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I do think there's been some confusion over the years, but you said it very well. And I'll repeat it again for our listeners as we're moving along. Thank you so much, Justin. I appreciate you calling and good luck. Thanks, and thanks for talking to me about it. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay, before we go to our next break, I want to take Sarah, who's been patiently waiting, and pass Christiane. Hi, Sarah. Well, hi. Um, It's not Sarah. It's Sonora. Oh, Sonora. Okay, I like that name. (laughs) Pretty. Thank you. Um, I have a... a a situation for that I wanted to ask your opinion on. Um, I am almost 70. Um, I'm really, really healthy. I, you know, I, I'm very active and I'm never sick. <laughs> so first of all, that's but, wonderful. Um, I, <laughs> I've always had most of my life, um, a chronic low grade to high grade depression. And so I've been on several different antidepressants for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And, um, about, and I, I had a lot of heart, a lot of difficulty in school, um, not from the depression, but because I kept falling asleep and, um, certain, uh, things triggered it. Like if my teacher turned a page <laughs> in a book, mm-hmm. uh, it put me to sleep, you know, and I, I never knew what was wrong with it, me until about 15 years ago. And I had all these sleep studies done. So anyway, it turned out that I have narcolepsy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and I have mild cataplexy. So every you know, every once in a while, my body wilts, but mostly it's just dropping to sleep. Okay, so I've been on Adderall. Right. Okay, so I've been on the antidepressants, 
and the antidepressant that I'm taking is, um, I'm looking at it, it is generic um, Zoloft. Mm-hmm. Sertraline, then, okay. Yeah, yeah, sertraline. And then the... Um, and, and then when I got my sleep studies done, um, they said I don't produce enough cretin, I think it's called, uh, in my brain or whatever. And so they put me on the generic Adderall. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. okay, I take those two things um, and I do function pretty well, I pretty well. But my question is about this is I read an article the other day about dopamine and it was saying that when you take dopamine, you're like, like you get dopamine from say chocolate, you take a bite of chocolate and the dopamine in your brain says, Ooh, that's good. Have another bite. (laughs) And you know, that's what I was reading about dopamine. That's all I know. But I'm just wondering about this. I do well. I feel okay. I mean, I feel great, actually. But I'm constantly, constantly, nonstop. I have to have something in my mouth, like an oral gratification. Like, I either, I, I, I'm, I don't live a smoker's lifestyle. I, I run, I meditate, I do, I eat clean, all that. But I cannot stop putting something in my mouth, either a cigarette, food, you know, just I've got to all, it's, it's like nonstop scary. <laughs> and I thought, well, I wonder if it's because of there's maybe there's dopamine increase in my um, antidepressant. Hmm. Oh, it took a long time to get there. I'm no, 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 no. Um, well, that's really, really interesting, Sarah. Um, I'm I'm sorry, I said your name wrong again. Um, say your name again for me. It's Sonora. 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 Like, yeah. like the Sonora Desert. That's very interesting, Sonora. I, um, I think that so many times individuals with different neurochemical issues like ADHD, um, and and certainly there's been some question because n- narcolepsy is a really interesting disorder. And for for our listeners, I guess most know that the sort of the hallmark of nor- narcolepsy is just you you suddenly fall asleep, lose consciousness for a. a a few seconds and the treatment is the same treatment or similar treatment that we use for ADHD and that is a central nervous system stimulant like Adderall Adderall is one of the most common ones used and so and it and it appears to to treat it fairly well so there have been some studies that have looked at actually overeating and ADHD for that sort of impulsive need uh, of, of movement or whatever. And so, you know, again, some of the treatments, the similar treatments because of the the appetite suppression effect that Adderall can have for overeating before some of the newer medicines came out were the stimulants. Adderall, again, one of the stimulants that is most likely to cause appetite suppression. And so, you know, what you're bringing up is is something I I really am, am not completely sure of. Uh, It has been shown that particularly dark chocolates, caffeines do increase dopamine. They do it for a short period of time. So it may, in, in truth, help your ability to concentrate and stay focused. The chocolate, the caffeine, they both can. They're not very good at long term use because they're so short acting. And so you have to keep doing it. Not sure what's going yeah. on with you, Sonora, because I um, that that oral fixation almost sounds like one of those obsessive in nature, and so um, 
something interesting. Have you ever talked to your doc who's treating your narcolepsy about that? Well, actually, no, because um, I just read that article about dopamine, Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't really, you know, I don't have a tendency. I've never in my whole life had a tendency to gain weight. I've always been the same weight my whole life. Um, So it's amazing to me that I can eat nonstop, you know, and not gain weight. But I, but I do like, so, uh, but I haven't brought it up to her because I didn't even think about maybe Zoloft is makes me have more dopamine and maybe that's what I'm maybe that's what's causing it because it doesn't seem like I've always had this eating mm-hmm. thing it seems like you know it's been the last few years or it, it's it's either there's either food going in my mouth a cigarette going in my mouth coffee going in my mouth it's constant <laughs> Yeah, there may, well, if we could stay away from the cigarettes, it would certainly be good because you want to, mm-hmm. to think about that. You know, you might go back uh, to your doc and see, because I have had a couple of patients, although it's not a common problem, I've had a couple of patients who've gained quite a bit of weight on Zoloft, even though it's not supposed to be one of the meds that's bad about that. So, you might you might check on that. It sounds like you're not really worried at all about your weight, and certainly we wouldn't wouldn't want to cause any weight loss. But there might be another medication that might help. Well, butrin is one, and I'm just throwing that out there. And keep in mind, I do not know you, and I do not know your medical history. But well, butrin has been a medication that has been a fairly decent dual dual treatment for ADHD and anxiety and or depression. And so it does have some dopamine and norepinephrine effect. And so you might want to just rediscuss that and just kind of see see where you are with that and and see if perhaps you could get some help um, in, in maybe changing medicine. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be harming me. It's just making me feel weird uh-huh. that I have that you know, fixation. Like, <laughs> yeah. And why can I stop? And I really don't want to be a smoker. And I didn't smoke for 25 years. Started five years ago. And um, and it's like an obsession. Mm. And it's so out of my lifestyle. You know, I, I and I, yeah. Yeah. So I was just, yeah, I was. And if maybe the combination would ring a bell with you, like, hmm, yeah, that could make you, like, obsessive compulsive or something. Mm. That's what I'm feeling. Yeah, but it does sound like, you know, the the stimulant certainly can increase obsessive behaviors and make you overfocus, but certainly it sounds like you might need the Adderall for the narcolepsy. So I again, I would call your doc, make sure y'all talk all the way through that and 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 make sure that they're listening. That's one of those things. You want to make sure they hear everything you're talking about, not just maybe one or one of the symptoms. But but everything we just talked through is really important to be able to discern what's going to be your best direction for treatment. Okay? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks so much. That's a very interesting call, Sonora. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with my producer, Abram Nanny. And today we're talking about ADHD or anxiety or medication not working or depression. Or is it just getting a little older? What is causing the difficulties that you are having? Or maybe it's more than one thing. So as we talk through this, I think it's really important to make sure you think through everything. Think through the, the history, what your history was, how your life has been, what maybe were some of the bumps in the road that you had, where were some of the ditches that you got into, and then... What has been the most effective treatment, or have you found one? Are you still struggling? And if you are, 
what is the most profound issue that you're struggling with? I always talk to my my parents and my patients about this. When when someone comes in and it sounds like there may be more than one issue going on, for example, there may truly be some anxiety and ADHD, or there may truly be some mild depressive symptoms going on or obsessive compulsive symptoms. The What I like to do is to sit down and sort of put in order of priority, what issue is the most problematic? What could we fix today? What one thing, if you had to fix one thing today, what would that be the one thing that you would want to focus on? Because sometimes if you do it in a stepwise manner, you can rule out the other issues. And by rule out, that means sort of De- determine that maybe those other issues weren't big deals and that this overriding issue was my obsessive compulsive disorder, for example. And now that I got that treated, I don't feel depressed anymore because now I have that piece treated. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, there's so many other mental disorders that also include uh, depression or anxiety or, you know, attention loss or, you know, so many other things that um, are applied or involved with ADHD or bipolar disorder or some other stuff like that. Yeah, you just mentioned bipolar disorder, and it might be good just to touch on that today, too, because many times bipolar disorder is confused with severe ADHD and vice versa. Is it? Yes. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Especially in the younger population. And so let's let's talk about that for just a minute. Um, because our first caller talked about the overfocus that that he had with ADHD, and in bipolar disorder, individuals, you know, typically bipolar disorder presents in the later teens, early twenties, um, for a little while, unfortunately, and I say it unfortunately because I think way too many young children were diagnosed with bipolar disorder at four, five, or six, and. And that is highly unusual. And so I would discourage people for going for that diagnosis that early on. Typically, there there might be some early signs in the early, early teens, but typically it's a disorder that really presents a little bit later in life. But what can happen with that is um, when an individual is is in a more manic state, they'll really focus on something and not be able to let go of it and just seem extremely on um, that topic. And then what can happen, though, is they can jump from one sort of over-focus to another in a manic type. And then during the lower times, the more depressed times or the hypomanic times, many times an individual cannot concentrate because they are are more in the depressive realm. So it's really important to have a differentiation between that, you don't want a mistaken bipolar disorder for ADHD or vice versa because the medication treatments are very, very different. I'm going to throw out our phone number because I'd love to hear from any of our listeners if you have any particular questions. We're getting on up into the later part of the show. So jump in and give us a call if you have some thoughts or questions. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's 877-672-7464. Now, you said that the uh, treatments for ADHD and bipolar are very different, even though they can kind of display 
in several similar ways. Yeah. So you're saying would ADHD be like a less severe treatment or would bipolar be more aggressive or how how does that apply? Oh, well, not so much aggressive or laid back treatment as much as with ADHD, the neurochemicals that we, we know that you're looking at, at treating dopamine and norepinephrine, the stimulants typically work very well for ADHD. Um, and those would be first line treatments for ADHD, whereas with bipolar disorder, you're typically looking at at more mood stabilization and and mood issues, which typically there there are different classes of medication for that, and so you want to be be careful about confusing the two. And, and like I said, I think in adults, the the adult population typically it's it's a little more obvious. Uh, with the bipolar, I think in the child population, sometimes uh, that that diagnosis and perhaps mistreatment happens more often. Right. And obviously you never want to like assume, but would you naturally, if someone comes in and says, my four-year-old, I think my four-year-old might be bipolar, would you, or might have bipolar disorder, would you say that no, they're more likely to have ADHD. Is that what you would diagnose it as? Again, taking a really good history, but yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, like I said, I'm very reticent to make the diagnosis of bipolar in a four-year-old. Uh, first of all, as we've always said, uh, sort of the definition of of a toddler is that up and down in that manic and then on the floor in a temper tantrum. And so... Some of that's just typical behavior. And so you want to make sure you take a really good history. Now, sometimes parents who have bipolar disorder or have a relative with bipolar will become very anxious very early when they start seeing behaviors. And so we'll bring that up. So I always listen. I always take a very, very good history. I think it's important to make sure that you you know what all the symptoms are and to be very laid back um, as far as medication treatment, but obviously behavioral treatment in in very young children is very important. Okay, let's go back to the phones because we have a couple of calls I want to make sure to get to. Um, Ashley in Hattiesburg, some questions about the difference between anxiety and ADHD. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Hey, how are you? Great. Um, so it's not a question. I just wanted to make a comment that, sure. um, especially for older generations who really think that, you know, therapy is not for them and that medicine isn't the answer or whatever, um, I think it's important to note that sometimes there's really big stressful events that can happen in your life back to back that can cause this anxiety that might present as other things, but really it's a temporary thing that it's okay to be on medicine, like Wellbutrin, for example, for six months or a year to make it through, you know, the death of three family members or just any kind of really tragic events that can come up in life um, that might be big stress causers. Um, yeah, I just thought it was important to touch on that. It might not always be something permanent for people and that it could just be like reflecting on where you're at in life and what's going on that could be causing those things yeah. at the moment. Ashley, great point. And, and you're absolutely correct. And what we call that is an adjustment disorder. And you can have features of emotion or conduct or depression or whatever. And sometimes it, the symptoms will be significant enough to need a medication for a short period. And, and perhaps you can come off because it's not a long term diagnosis adjustment disorders, typically, hopefully, you can get through within six months or so. And so that's a really good point. I appreciate you calling in on that one and letting our listeners know. That's why I love having our callers call in. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And, you know, the the medicines Ashley mentioned, listeners, are are good ones. Sometimes it, it may take something like Wellbutrin, maybe be um, an SSRI like Lexapro or Zoloft or whatever. 
Um, but most of the time for an adjustment disorder, don't forget counseling. Counseling should be at the top of the list. All right. Let's go to our next caller. We have Rachel in Eupora. Hey, Rachel. Hey. Um, I just wanted to mention some simple things that help me to operate at an optimum and not have um, anxiety or uh ADHD symptoms. I've never been diagnosed with ADHD, but I do know some some things about it. And a close friend of mine, I have all the symptoms that she has, and she does have ADHD. Mm-hmm. And the things that I have to watch out for as an elder, the older I've gotten, the more I need to pay attention to make sure that I am not dehydrated that I am not constipated, and that I have had enough caffeine. And Mm -hmm. those sound like simple things, but I can go around in a fog for a few days before it hits me. Oh, you need to start drinking your water again. Or, oh, you've got to get regular again. Mm -hmm. And I never function uh, well without some caffeine. Rachel, very, very good points, especially the the hydration state and and like I mentioned earlier, caffeine can certainly help with concentration as long as you don't use huge amounts and uh, become right. jittery and anxious with it. The other thing I want to mention too, a couple of things real quick since you tagged that one in, I think it's so important. Uh, Not only hydration, but nutritional state. Many times as we get older, we don't absorb nutrients as well. So to make sure that you're eating very healthy, many times old people get into a pattern of eating the same thing over and over again. So you can miss out on good nutrients that you need. And then the final thing I want to mention, and you hear this all the time, and I bet many of our listeners have had this happen to an aged loved one. A urinary tract infection can Mm. change the mental state of older individuals. So to make sure that if someone suddenly has a change in their mental awareness, their cognitive state, to think about a urinary tract infection or some sort of silent infection perhaps causing symptoms. So that's another thing to think about, okay? Rachel, thank you so much for calling and and throwing those things out. That's important for all of our listeners to know. All right, we have one more caller, Jade in Pike County, with a question about bipolar symptoms that I want to get to. Hi, Jade. Hello, how are you this morning? Doing great, thank you. Uh, I have a question that is kind of, I just happened to tune in. My mom is concerned about my younger sister who moved to social economic decline. And when she does come home, like she'll want to come home, she'll come home, and she's like the white rabbit. She's all over the place trying to get things done, but completes absolutely nothing and leaves everything looking like it's in a full-on hurricane. Mm. Um, she she has one child that she is very, very, always has been a bit disconnected from, but very, very distant from. And sometimes she's really, really up. And then when, she, when she's down and settled, it's like, where, you know, where have you been? This is the person that we know. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know how to help her or my mother because at this point she's getting to a point where she's like i'm living in my car but it's cheaper and we're like you can come home though like everybody has a home that you can come to and have by yourself yeah jade i have just about 30 seconds to give you a quick answer it certainly sounds like she needs an evaluation and i'll tell you the couple of things that stand out in my mind is that up and down and all around kind of stuff it really does smack of bipolar or could there be drugs involved that are compounding it many times people with mental health issues will throw in some drugs and trying to self-medicate, which then will just make the issues 10 times worse. So, um, Jade, maybe next week you can call back with this because I think we might need to have a continuation of this kind of show because I, I 
think clearly there are issues that are ongoing, but to consult a mental health specialist would be really important. I want to thank all our callers for calling in and our listeners. And if you'd like to hear this show again or any past episodes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast app by searching Southern Remedy, Relatively Speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio, engineered by my producer, Abram Nanny. And I'm not sure who our call screener was. I think just about the whole cast of the MPB cast. Think Radio. Thank you, everybody. Today. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking. And stay tuned for NPR's Here Now, coming up next right here on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.